I'll start with the gong. Just letting the sound of the gong draw, <clears throat> draw us into it more and more. Okay, welcome back. Nice to see you all. <laughs> so I'm going to begin by leading the uh, meditation inclusive mode meditation of extending care or love to others. And to, again, to enter into this practice we begin it with our field of care to reestablish our secure base of unconditional care. <clears throat> the field of care helps, uh, helps bring out, evoke, helps us access loving qualities from our basic awareness. So we're learning how to access those in that way and then steepen them. And that's, that's a secure base of unconditional care. And then we can let the flow of lo loving energy from that secure base extend to others. And that flow of loving energy, like a gentle radiance, uh, helps, us sense, ha helps us sense other people or beings beyond uh, superficial judgments and reactions, just sensing them more in their fuller life and dignity and potential. So we're using the loving energy to help us commune in that way, sense into the subjectivity of other persons, sensing them as more than just our uh, habits of labeling, judging, uh, sensing them as more than just our superficial impressions, perhaps also as more than their own uh, reductive judgments on themselves, sensing more in them, more potential, more dignity, unconditional worth, letting the loving energy help us kind of commune, resonate, sense, relate to that, then of course, wish them deeply well. So that's how the field of care meditation helps establish a kind of an inner core of unconditional care from which we can then let the loving energy extend and help us commune, connect, resonate, sense into, wish deeply well, kind of commune and resonate with others beyond the whole silly world of everybody reacting to superficial impress impressions, labels and judgments upon each other, which we're all doing actually almost all the time. So the, that's how we use the meditation and engage it. So when first learning to do this extending love meditation, the, the, the way to first learn it that I suggest is the way we're doing it, which is you begin with someone nearby in your vicinity or in your world or someone that you think of. And this could be someone familiar to you or it could be a stranger. But I, I would say not, do not begin with someone that you have a strong aversion toward or someone that you hate. Um, because then you will not, then we were not, we'll, we cannot establish, uh, we cannot establish kind of a, a basic way forward with it, sensing our way into it. Instead of sensing our way into it, we'd be too busy thinking about how much we hate this person. So in order to just learn how to begin to do it, we need to just think of anybody nearby or in our vicinity or in our world. Um, it could be someone familiar to us. It could be a, it could be a stranger. 
who've not, in, not been introduced, but not someone you hate. But as the practice becomes familiar through repetition, part of its, part of the amazing power of it, with repetition, as we become familiar with it, we can extend it more inclusively, also to those we have disliked and even, even to those we have hated. That can actually happen. But we have to build the secure base and the foundation for that to unfold naturally with uh, repeated practice. So we don't begin with someone we hate. So beginning this practice with someone nearby us helps us learn to do it in daily life with anyone who is nearby in, in, in the moment or with anyone that we think of or hear of. Okay, so let's just do the practice in a brief way and then I'll get to questions. You can begin by just sitting in a relaxed way. Eyes can be open, uh, looking downward if you wish. And just settle into some, uh, into the body and with abdominal breathing. So our natural rhythm of breathing, but breathing into the abdomen so you feel it inhale feel it uh, expand as you inhale really feel that expanding as you inhale back comfortably straight relaxed and then let the feeling of the abdomen expanding and contracting just draw you into it more and more So nothing to figure out with this. You just let the feeling of the abdomen draw you into it more and more, into that feeling. And now bring to mind your field of care. It could be a caring moment that makes you happy to recall or a benefactor that you're grateful has been in your life or a spiritual figure meaningful to you. So bring your field of care to mind. Again, not just as a distant memory or abstraction, but as real as happening here right now, present here with you now in that way. And you are being seen as deeply worthy of love and care. That is happening now. And just relax into the felt sense of this field of care, just steeping in its loving energy and tender qualities and letting them pervade your whole being. accepting this loving energy and its qualities spaciously into your whole body and mind. Into every part of your body and into every layer of feeling and emotion. As if every part of you is loved in its very being. Just allowing that, steeping in that. Letting this loving energy just seep into every part of you more and more. Just allowing it. Every part of you loved. And if part of you is having difficulty with this practice, drawing your attention elsewhere, 
And just become spaciously aware of that part of you, that sense of self and what it's feeling in a deeply allowing way. Just letting it have all the space it needs to find its own place in this caring openness and settle in its own way. And now think of someone nearby and while continuing to receive this loving energy from within your own field of care, let that energy come through you now to that other person as if you're a window pane for it. So the gentle radiance of this loving energy just pervades that person's whole being coming through you to them. And let that flow of loving energy help you sense that other person in their deep dignity and worth and potential while wishing them deeply well. Beyond superficial impressions. Just repeatedly wishing them well and letting the flow of loving energy come through you to them. Sensing them beyond superficial impressions as someone with a full life and dignity and also layers of suffering beyond all superficial impressions and just wishing them well. And if part of you feels doubtful about this or has trouble with it, then just settle back into your field of care and become spaciously aware of that part of you, that sense of self and its feelings in a deeply allowing way with spacious compassion. And if that part of you and its feelings relaxes and settles, then you can return to the extending practice again, letting the loving energy come through you to the other person. And if you wish, at this point, you can let this flow of loving energy come through you more broadly now to everyone nearby around you. And let that flow of energy help you sense them in their deep dignity and potential and layers of suffering beyond superficial impressions and judgments. And just wish them deeply well. And now let's just relax into the felt sense of this care or acceptance or 
loving energy, however it is for you, just relax into that feeling. And let that help your heart and mind to just trust and relax and let go of its frameworks and constructs of mind. So letting the mind just become gently, completely open like space. And let this unity of space and awareness do the meditating by just letting everything be. Let this unity of space and awareness do the meditating by just letting everything be. Good, thank you. So here are some, here are the questions or uh, as many of them as I can connect to. Are you ready? Here comes a question. So someone says, you said last night that practitioners should not talk about their meditation practice. Is that something we should avoid? In our Sangha groups, we share our meditation experiences and talk about them. So let me clarify, uh, maybe what I said was not clear enough. I was speaking in regard to the kind of meditation we just did, just that meditation in which we're letting loving energy extend through us to others, letting that help us uh, kind of sense them as more than all of our superficial impressions and wish them deeply well. It's actually like a great unmasking. At this time when we're all wearing masks, this is the great unmasking because everyone all along has been masked in a way, metaphorically been masked by our superficial impressions of them that hide them from us. So what this meditation does is it pulls down the mask. All the superficial impressions, superficial judgments, superficial labels for others, as if all they are is the label that's in our mind for them at the moment, which we're doing almost all the time. It's like a mask that's hiding the fact that there's a fuller human being there who actually transcends all of these superficial labels, who has a whole life, many struggles. It's trying to find a way to be well and happy. Fears for her or his loved ones or their loved ones. And on and on. Uh, much of that is masked by our own superficial impressions of everyone almost all the time. This is our problem. These meditations are starting to undercut that mask that is hiding everyone, the mask of our own superficial impressions that we have mistaken for them. In that way, this is a very profound practice and all the other practices we've been doing have been preparing for it. But when we enter into a practice like this, now we've got this loving energy coming through us. It's helping us to resonate, connect, sense others, commune with them, wish them deeply well, recognize that there's a fuller being there of great mystery, 
and depth and potential and dignity, totally beyond all my superficial impressions. And just a stranger, oh, just an old guy, oh, just one of those people. Or even, even the superficial label, my friend, what's that? Are they mine? There's so much more there than any of our labels. So here we are letting this loving energy help us sense that much more, relate to that in them, wish them deeply well, that much more there. Uh, we do not then tell the person that we are communing with in that way. We do not then speak to that person and say, oh, by the way, I've been sending you loving energy. What do you think about that? Isn't that cool? <clears throat> Aren't I cool? That's what we do not do. We do not talk about it. We just practice it privately. We don't tell people that we're doing it in relation to them. So that's what I'm referring to. It's important to keep this extending love and care practice private to not tell people that you are extending caring energy to them in order to make a protected space for this practice that avoids imposing our own ideas about it on others aggressively. And also in, avoids inviting others' misinterpretations before we've even deepened enough in the practice to understand it very well ourselves. So is that sort of clear? That's what I'm talking about. Of course, within our practice communities and with our meditation teachers, we discuss how we're practicing and we're learning from each other. I'm not, I'm not talking about, I'm not saying don't do that. I'm saying something more specific about this particular practice. We keep it private. And that's the tradition of it in the, in the Tibetan cultures from which I'm adapting it. So is that clear enough now to everybody? No confusion, I hope. Okay. So someone's asking, is it okay to share these practices that, that John, that you have offered with others, even if we are not fully steeped in them or very experienced in them? But thank you so much for asking that question. So I would say it is better to, to become experienced in them ourselves. That's really our job not mainly to go around sharing them without ourselves doing them quite a lot. So better to get experienced in them. But if you know others that you think may want to know about them, so not imposing practices like this upon others. Oh, I think this would be really good for you. Here, do this. Um, perhaps even if I have not done it very much myself here, but I think it's good for you. This is so much what we do with each other in the name of love and care is so aggressive and so not really very loving. Anyhow, I'm not saying that that's what the question has in mind at all, but I'm just saying I, I see a lot of that, though. So I think better if, if you think that, that this is something that someone would want to know about and may want to connect with, then I do suggest really linking them to the website for the Foundation for Active Compassion, which is the main organization that I teach through. And it's on the first page of your meditation handout. Connect, connect them to that. And then, um, and, I, and they, they could explore linking to one of the meditation groups online that are leading these very practices. They're going on every weekly in a good number of meditation groups online. That people could connect right into that. And it's tremendous support for learning these practices and deepening in them. So you, that could be suggested to someone. And on that same website, then uh, you can also see that there are the further teachings that I'm giving and other teachers I teach with and many further resources, including the recordings for this very course itself also are appearing on that website as well. Someone is asking, oh yeah, then that would became the next question. We, we would appreciate having a way to access these recordings of your teachings for this course after it ends. And that's the place to go for that as well. They're being posted on the website for the other co-sponsoring organization, Foundation for Active Compassion, the main organization I teach through. So is that 
that clear enough? That's where you can find the recordings. And someone, then there are a lot of other great questions. So I wanna to get to as many as I can. So on a daily basis in this pandemic crisis, we are witnessing loving kindness by so many, yet also on many levels, the outcome of this global crisis appears to be a hell realm of tragedy and injustice for many. The feelings of frustration and anger at how the federal government continues to create confusion and opportunism is deeply disturbing. I've noticed that too, <laughs> and also been disturbed. Uh, any insight, John, on how this practice may include or alleviate some of our personal upset? So there I have to say that it's just a matter of becoming more and more precise and rigorous with noticing any such feeling. There is no need for, for different practices than what I've already introduced with regard to those feelings. It's just a matter of noticing, oh, those are feelings. Feelings of, being, of feeling deeply disturbed, feeling very frustrated, feeling anger, feeling angry. Those are feelings. So letting the, um, the, the profoundly uh, compassionate holding environment that the field of care establishes so that all of our feelings as we connect with the field of care we're accessing all spacious loving qualities of, of warmth deep acceptance deep allowing compassion for for any feeling let the that very feeling frustration anger let that notice that that's a feeling let that feeling be um, welcomed into that space of profound acceptance, compassion, care. Let that feeling come in. So you see the problem here that, John, can you give me a practice for what I do with these feelings? But I did, I did. It's just a matter, of, there's another aspect of this practice which is just noticing that you're having feelings and noticing that all that time in prior sessions when I talked about letting any such feeling be embraced in the spacious care and deep acceptance of that, that we're experiencing in the field of care meditation. It's just to notice that I meant the very feelings you're talking about, them. So we don't have to compartmentalize our life so sort of like uh, in a meditation session, it seems like that's really nice with whatever feelings happen to be there in that moment. But then I have my real life and the rest of my day when I'm really angry and frustrated with the federal government. What do I do about that? Give me a practice for that. You see the problem? It, it seems like maybe the question also has to do with the importance of learning how to integrate the practice into our day. And again, the way to do that is to do the practice first thing in the morning and then repeatedly reconnect with it during our day, again and again, in little moments, even briefly, even for just a minute or two. If we do that enough, if we pepper our day with that, it'll be there and we'll start to answer our own questions like this. Oh, this very feeling of anger at the federal government. Oh, that's what this is about, this very feeling. And as we let that feeling be held in the spacious compassion of this practice, and as, and as it begins to relax and settle, then our lens, our, per, our perception, our perspective on everyone that we're thinking about also begins to open. and they are no longer just cartoon characters. We may strongly disagree with how people like that are thinking about all this. We may strongly disagree, but actually have a capacity to recognize them as human beings, to actually feel care for them, even as we strongly disagree with them. That's actually possible, and that's what this practice helps us learn.
also compassionate presence to feelings is a powerful practice for this same thing. Whatever feeling we're experiencing during our day, any time in our day, to become compassionately aware of it in the way of that practice, which is really one piece with the field of care practice. So letting whatever feeling we're experiencing of anger, frustration, despair, hopelessness, fear, loneliness, depression, whatever the feeling is, and becoming aware of it in this spaciously, deeply allowing and accepting way that gives it so much space, allows it to feel so welcome to be here, that it actually, once it feels that, can no longer function the same way. It has to just kind of snuggle in because it is that quality of lo unconditional love and care that our feelings have been seeking for so long that we have not known how to give them. And once they begin to feel it, they can begin to uh, appreciate that, really appreciate it. They're no longer experienced the same way, but we have to, we have to explore that in our own practice. And that's really done throughout our days not just at a special, not only in a meditation cushion at a special time. Another question is, as the pandemic continues and I remain cooped up in the house, I find it increasingly difficult to have compassionate feelings toward others. Even my dog is getting on my nerves. That is a severe situation. How could my dog get on my nerves? But, but I believe you. Yeah, I suppose a dog can get on your nerves. My dog used to chase skunks, for example, and he never learned. And he always got really sprayed, right on the snout usually. This was not a smart dog. Uh, and then there was a whole huge thing that we had to do for this dog. So I understand that the dog can really get on your nerves as well, absolutely. What I wanna raise up though is, like in the spirit of these practices of field of care that in which we're spaciously becoming present to our feelings or compassionate presence to feelings meditation, sort of a spacious, deep allowing and accepting so the feelings can find their own place in their own way, begin to settle in. What we need to start noticing is that our reactions to others. So the question was, I find it increasingly difficult to have compassionate feelings toward others. What we need to notice is that our reactions to others contain our own feelings. So the practice does not involve forcefully trying to get oneself to be very loving and compassionate. I'm going to make myself loving and compassionate. I should have compassionate feelings toward others. What's going wrong with all this? Because I just don't feel compassionate feelings toward others. I'm finding them really annoying. No, what we need, this is why I spent so many weeks on the receptive mode and then with the compassionate presence to feelings. So, in the field of care meditation. That's why we spent time, took our time with it. And then the compassion presence feelings. What they're helping us to learn how to do, but now we need to do it, is notice in all such reactions that there are feelings in those reactions. So this sense that, oh, I should be comp feeling compassionately toward others, but I'm just feeling annoyed by them. That's a feeling. You feel annoyed <laughs> or you feel guilty for not being compassionate enough. You've just been given something precious by the situation. You've been given a feeling. You following? What feeling? Well, I'm feeling guilty because I'm just not com being compassionate. I think I should be compassionate. Okay, that's a feeling. You're feeling guilty about that or feeling frustrated or feeling annoyed with those others. That's a feeling that they've helped to trigger in you. Now practice with that feeling take it into the field of care practice or the compassion presence to feelings practice. But that's your job. <laughs> you have to notice that you're, ha that you're experiencing a feeling and you have to take that feeling into the practice. And I just spent these past few weeks trying to give you the tools for that. Now we have those tools. And now it's up to you to first to notice when you have a feeling, which is pretty much all the time, even if you just feel numb, that's a feeling. So notice it. Feel how it feels within, not just thinking about it. Not quickly trying to solve it or change it. Feel how that feels. 
and now take it into practice. Become spaciously aware of it in a deeply allowing way. Then things will begin to shift. But we have to really do that. Not ignore all that and then ask for a different practice. That is the practice. Here's another great question. Could you please provide a Tibetan Buddhist perspective on establishing clear and healthy boundaries in relationships? Do bodhisattvas need social boundaries? The question brings up a part of me that feels that I'm failing because I feel a need for clear social boundaries at this stage of my development. You following the question? It's a good question, isn't it? So the kinds of social boundaries that we need to support our relations to others, what I wanna suggest is that they can change as we progress, as we develop and as we progress in practice. The kinds of social boundaries that are needed, that are appropriate, they can change, can't they? It doesn't have to just be fixed for life. So, our minds are accustomed to being fully identified with one or another part of us, one or another sense of self at the moment that is trying to manage our relations to others so we don't get hurt. And that part of us may establish the boundaries that it needs to do that work for us. But these practices of sustainable compassion training help us to unblend, unblend from any such part by learning how to inhabit a fuller awareness that can hold the part in care. So we no longer are just that part in our experience. We are the fuller awareness that's holding that part in care in the field of care meditation or in the compassionate presence to feelings meditation. We are the fuller awareness holding that part in care. We are no longer just the part, so we are unblended, at least to some degree. And when we unblend from any such part by inhabiting that fuller awareness that's holding it in care, then in the releasing phase of all these meditations, we're learning to settle back into the depth of that fuller awareness, into the basic openness and simplicity and warmth available in our fuller awareness. We're settling back into that background of openness and um, pure cognizance and warmth. which are, are available in the depth of our being. So as we reconnect repeatedly in that way, with that depth of our being in practice, we can start to come from that depth in our relationship with others. That is, sensing them in their, their depth, relating to them in their depth, in their fuller awareness recognizing that they are more than any one part of them, even if their mind is identified with a particular part at the moment, but sensing the much more in them. This extending mode practice we just did, this inclusive mode, extending love and care, is really, is really taking us into the, what, I'm, what I'm saying now. Sensing the more in them, which is also sensing their fuller awareness, their fuller dignity, capacity, potential, more than just this or that part of them, even if their mind is identified just with an angry part or a controlling part or a reacting part. So what? Sensing the fuller person there, more than one part, even if they cannot yet. But we can only do that as we learn to unblend from parts ourselves in the practices that we've been exploring. Are you following so far? But this means that boundaries what kind of boundaries are needed to hold the relationship properly in a way that helps people to, to discover more of their capacity and potential and to flourish? What boundaries now are needed? They'll be different. They will be different. 
So as we learn how to reconnect and practice repeatedly with more of the depth of our being, our fuller awareness, not just totally identified with one part, and we start to sense others more in their fuller awareness and in their depth and relate to them in that and learn how to speak to that in them, speak to their depth, speak to their deep dignity and capacity and potential. Kind of like that, that's the part of the meaning of the Hawkwind story I told last night. That's part of what it means. Hawkwind was speaking to the depth of that samurai, here open the gates of hell. That samurai's deep capacity for discernment to recognize what had happened. That's what Hakuin was doing. He was speaking from depth to depth, from his depth to the depth of the samurai, and here open the gates of heaven. It's the depth of the samurai's awareness that could understand that, what that meant. And it's also very much what a good parent does, or a teacher, or a counselor. It is speaking to the deep hidden strengths, capacities, and potential of the person that they're with, the child, the patient, the student, speaking to them in their deep capacity and potential, even before they may realize how much potential and capacity they have. That's also what a really good teacher or counselor or parent does, isn't it? So we're just learning how to access that way of being and relating more and more reliably and not just with our child if we're a loving parent or our student if we're a very good teacher but with anyone and at that point we can see what social boundaries are needed to help us stay connected with the depth of our being and to relate to others from there and what social boundaries those others need in this kind of deeper level of relationship. And generally, without even talking about it, just like a parent doesn't talk about all this with the child, I'm speaking to your fuller potential, Billy, or the teacher doesn't have to talk about that with the student. Um, you, know, you don't see all of your potential, but I see it, so I'm speaking to your potential, Sally. We don't have to talk about all that. We just learn better to be that way. That's the process. So here comes another good question. You, John, you talk about our feelings, knowing how to heal themselves, like in the field of care meditation or compassion presence to feelings when they're, we walk on them into that spacious field of care and compassion, deeply allowing. Uh, or the letting be meditation. So I'm wondering where this idea comes from that feelings can can heal themselves in this way. And is there evidence for that? So what I would say is that these practices, like field of care, compassion, presence to feelings, letting bees that are adapted from Tibetan Buddhism, although the basic pattern of them from receptivity into deepening, into being able to include others and extend care to others, which is also shared with uh, developmental psychology. But these, these practices provide an environment of spacious acceptance and allowing and compassion for feelings that helps them feel safe and relax and settle and heal and release. So because of the constructed empty nature of feelings, emotional feelings can heal and release in this way if they have the space and freedom to do so. And that space of freedom is what we've not given our feelings in the past because of our socialized habits of suppressing feelings and avoiding them and distracting ourselves from them or tightly identifying with them. We haven't known how to give them this kind of a space of freedom and simple acceptance. We haven't known that most of us before. But many practitioners of Dzogchen and Mahamudra, the Tibetan traditions that I'm teaching from, this is also shared in many Zen traditions of East Asia, over centuries, many practitioners have experienced this space of freedom for feelings as profoundly healing and releasing in this way. And the deep acceptance of feelings is also a practice in, in, the, in various mindfulness practice traditions. And a similar approach to deep acceptance of feelings as a key to healing 
is embedded in several of the leading psychotherapeutic paradigms that are informed by Buddhist practices, such as acceptance commitment therapy, dialectical behavior therapy, and with a, a good number now of research studies on these psychotherapeutic modalities and on also various forms of mindfulness that especially cultivate deep acceptance and compassion for feelings, kind of along the lines that we're doing here. Um, so there's both anecdotal, a lot of anecdotal evidence of practitioners through the centuries, thousands and thousands, and also um, uh, modern scientific research that indicates that this can be deeply healing. But here comes another good question. Uh, why do parts of us believe so strongly that the source of care is external to us? Is everybody following? I, I mentioned that the other night, uh, last night too. Why do parts of us, that is these senses of self that, that come up and kind of take over and uh, point our attention in certain ways, why do parts of us believe so strongly that the source of love and care is external to us? Is it because there's such a long period of dependency in human development, i.e. from infancy through childhood and adolescence and into young adulthood, dependence on others for love and care? And I would say, yes, absolutely, that is the reason. So let me put it this way. As children, when a caring figure is present to us with love and care, and then, and, we, and then we feel loved and comforted from infancy and then all the way through childhood. If I feel upset when I was an infant and my mother came to me in a loving way, then I felt loved and comforted and well and cared for and happy. So what's happening is that the caring presence of the caring figure is evoking those feelings from my own awareness. I'm, I'm scaffolding on her. So her loving way of being present to me is evoking, is bringing out these capacities to feel loved, to feel what care feels like, to feel what it's like to be seen as loved to feel deeply well, to feel at home here, to feel safe here. Those kinds of feelings are, are, are come from capacities of my awareness. There's a long period of scaffolding on caring figures for those capacities to be evoked again and again and again. But once they have been, also happens even in caring moments with strangers, I, I would suggest. Once they have been, now then with the help of practices like this um, sustainable compassion training type practices, then um, we can learn to re-evoke those capacities from our awareness again and again and again and draw on them more and more to help our feelings process themselves in a deeply healing way, to establish a profoundly unconditional power of kind of inner secure base in loving qualities and depth of awareness. And from there then to become present in a caring way toward others. We can do that. But this distinction that I'm drawing right now, that actually others never just gave us these feelings, they evoked those feelings because we have a capacity for those feelings in our basic awareness in our nervous system really too. They evoked them, but they didn't give them to us. They didn't give us those capacities. They evoked those capacities. That's a, that's a very subtle distinction that an infant cannot possibly notice, nor a small child, nor do we notice it actually all the way through our childhood and into young adulthood. So I really appreciate the question. And so now, now we can notice that. These are capacities we can re-evoke now. And we do it analogously, that, and that's how it's been done in spiritual traditions, including Buddhism, but bring to mind your field of care, bring to mind whatever caring moment, benefactor figure for you, your field of spiritual ancestors. This is how it has worked, people. <laughs> that's how it works. Travel through Asia, travel through Africa, travel through the whole world. Go to all the rural areas. This is what people are doing. They're recalling their field of spiritual ancestors and they're held in it. 
in absolute care. And that's what's providing them, that's what's evoking for them their capacity from which they then can become fuller human beings. So we can also learn that. We wrote about this, Paul Condon and I, who I'm doing a bunch of writing with. He's also a teacher within the Foundation of Active Compassion that I also teach within. We have a whole circle of teachers. Many of them have been here for this course as well. But um, that one article that really talks about a lot of this is in the, um, the uh, why we're taking this approach with this receptive mode, with this sense that we're held in a field of care and how that relates to developmental psychology as well as spiritual traditions and why that has been left out so much from meditation, modern meditation programs, how that got dropped or not noticed or ignored, which is really a foundational error we feel. Um, that's written up in the article. You see it on the Barry, this course website, the Barry course website for this under the uh, supports that that are I provided for the course. So there's a meditation handout below that is that article, rediscovering the relational starting point of compassion training. So you could see much more on that there. Okay. So anyhow, great question. So now comes another question. When um, when we expand our awareness to all beings in our hearts, our hearts have access to the suffering of the pain of the world. How do we not become overwhelmed? You know, even if I know it is, it, it is so-called relative reality, but it still feels overwhelming to me, all this suffering and pain in the world. When our hearts open to all that, how do we not get overwhelmed? And then the questioner also is really cute, said, I, maybe I'm getting ahead. Maybe you're gonna teach about this in the next two weeks, but I just thought I'd ask. So yeah, as it turns out, that's what I'm gonna teach about in the next two weeks. <laughs> actually. But I can say something very briefly now. Um, what I'm going to talk about in the next two weeks, it has been, the foundations for it have been established by what we've done all the way up to now. So next week, I'll talk about taking our own painful or suffering feelings, or our own suffering layers of feeling into compassion for others. And then I'll talk about generating a very strong kind of will of compassion uh, for action. And um, in both of those teachings and sharing of meditations, we'll really get into this. Uh, in, in essence, what we need to learn to help not get overwhelmed and not get, um, not ex not get overwhelmed also by emotional um, depletion and so-called compassion fatigue and, and associated burnout and so forth, how not to get overwhelmed by all the suffering. The first thing is that we need to learn how to experience suffering as not the final or full reality here, but as encompassed in a larger reality that is encompassed, encompassed experiencing the suffering as encompassed in a holding environment of deep acceptance and care and compassion that is larger than the suffering. This is also a deep knowledge of spiritual traditions, not only Buddhism, which knows this, but also theistic traditions know this very, very well. To experience all our suffering as totally encompassed in and held in uh, a power and a reality of love and compassion and care that is much larger than the suffering itself. I think this sounds familiar to a few people. That's part of what's meant the love and compassion, that's part of what's meant by the love and compassion of God. That is part of what enabled Martin Luther King and civil rights activists around him whose lives were threatened, who knew they could die at any time to go on because everything they were experiencing was held in a much larger reality of compassion and love of God in Christ for them. Okay, I'm not a Christian, but I'm just telling you because I have to teach this stuff at Boston College. And I'm quite impressed with it, by the way, how unbelievably profound it is. The theology and, and religious and spiritual practice of someone like Martin Luther King is just stunning. But that's what we're talking about now. But we are also learning how to experience suffering in that way, our own and also others as held in a much larger reality 
The second thing that's needed is to let our, our painful feelings of empathy, when we empathize with others who are suffering and feel the, the pain of that empathy for them, we need to learn how to, how to let that, the pain of our own empathy to energize a very strong, compassionate attention outward toward them, rather than the pain of our empathy causing our mind to turn in upon ourselves and then get overwhelmed by our own pain. I'll get much more into this next week uh, and the week after next, actually. We do practices explicitly to do that, to take the pain of our empathy as a fuel for really powerful compassion for others. So it's kind of like you would never give up. You just keep going to try to address the suffering they're going through. You cannot be stopped. That kind of power of compassion that we see in people like Martin Luther King and Bishop Tutu and the Dalai Lama and Thich Nhat Hanh and, right? and Reza Parks and so many. We can learn that actually, There's, that can be learned how to avoid the pain of our empathy, turning our mind inward upon ourselves. So now we're caught in our own pain. And what started out as empathy for others becomes caught upness in our own pain, which is re becomes recurrent empathic distress is the term for it, which then becomes eventually overwhelming because we don't know how the pain of our empathy could actually be a fuel for intense compassion for others. We don't know how to do that but that can be done. And that's what we'll explore really, uh, especially in the next two weeks. Okay, and then he, there's just one more question and also a really great one. This is a question, there are other questions, but this is the last one that we have time for, but there's a question about the relationship of visualization practice to non-dual meditation experience. So this person is saying that during the, the kind of the, the envisioning of the field of care type practice, He's, so then this questioner is asking, she or he is asking, what if the experience of duality just dissolves? So I'm getting the impression that that may have happened for this questioner. So he, she or he describes what that means. At that point, references to me and others in the meditation instruction do not seem to pertain anymore because there's no boundary, but rather a vast unified field of compassion. At that point, is it important to hold on to the instructions and their dualistic language, like extending care to others? Or is it okay to let it simply fall away, the dualistic language, and just be that unified field of compassion? So that's wonderful to hear about. And what you're describing is the deepening mode of practice, which, is, which can become increasingly non-dual. That's what you're describing. So what you're what, the way I'm reading your question is that you spontaneously in the middle, let's say like, for example, like in the extending love practice we just did, you find that as you're extending, the, the loving energy is coming through you and it's helping you commune and resonate and connect and wish deeply well. But somehow the power of that then starts to deconstruct the framework of the practice itself. So that what's happening then is you become reun reunified with the source of the practice, which is a non-dual awareness. The source of the practice is actually non-dual awareness. It's that um, space of utter openness and pure cognizance and compassionate capacity that is the, uh, the deep nature of our mind. That's the source of all these loving qualities. So it, what I'm hearing in your question is that spontaneously for you, as the practice unfolds at some point, it deconstructs itself and reverts to the underlying non-dual source of the whole practice, which is uh, like a, an undivided, unified, non-dual field of compassion and openness and pure cognizance. And at that point, yeah, you can let that happen. And that's basically what's meant by the releasing phase. It's just that the releasing phase has spontaneously happened for you in the middle of your practice. But having said that, so that's a great thing that 
that is the deepening of motor practice. But having said that, uh, I, I would suggest that we need a balance of both kinds of practice, more dualistic, what are called more dualistic or more relative practices, where there's a sense of me being held in a field of care and that evokes qualities and that on the basis of that and from that secure base, I'm relating to others and sensing them as more than my superficial impressions or their superficial impressions of themselves even as, as deep mystery and kind of uh, deeply worthy of reverence and care, sensing them more like that in the, this extending of love and care practice. Those are very important practices to do also not just non-dual awareness practice. It's important to do both. That's why we do all these field of care type meditations and others, and they all have a releasing phase that then can, that in which we could, when ready, release more and more, even in the, in the direction of non-dual awareness, a great simplicity, a great simple releasing or letting go even of dualistic frameworks themselves, all frameworks of mind, all constructs of mind, as we're ready. We need both kinds of practice. Why do I say that? Because in our daily life, we need both kinds. We need to be able to relate to others within the dualistic frames of understanding that we're all operating in, in society and in relationship. We need to be able to relate to that in a way that draws on the powers of our underlying awareness, but doesn't lose, that doesn't drop our ability to relate to others also as individuals and communities. So we need both kinds of practice. In other words, we need both relative and ultimate practice. We need both dualistic and non-dualistic awareness. We need both. And then each can further open the other uh, in, power the other more and more. Okay, I might say a little more about that next week as well. Okay, that's, that's it for tonight. We're at the end of our time. So thank you all so much for being here. It's lovely to see you and uh, have a good evening or have a horrible evening, but at least take those feelings into the practice, please. Okay, thank you. <coughs>